morning, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Sorry about the short delay, but I had to load the, the um, talk up onto the computer. Uh, <coughs> I'm uh, Jimmy Simpson, and I'm a veterinary surgeon, and I'm based at the Royal Dick Veterinary College in Edinburgh. And I'm also a stalker, uh, an amateur stalker, not a professional stalker. So I have two kind of camps from which I'm talking from. And I'm also involved in uh, the Scottish Deer Project, which you may at some point want to have a look at at the internet, um, because what we're interested in doing is developing our knowledge on wild deer diseases in Scotland. Uh, and it's been a really tremendous project because people like yourselves have been inputting to it, and we've already developed a tremendous amount of knowledge on the subject of deer diseases in Scotland. However, depending on which um, of the agendas you looked at this morning, uh, my talk is actually going to be based on diseases of deer, which you may encounter uh, perhaps uh, in an urban setting. So I'm entitled to talk, <coughs> so you shot a roe deer, uh, and is it now fit for the food chain? And, and obviously as stalkers, our, our, our role is to check the carcass and make sure that it's free of diseases. And that's really going to be the focus of my talk this morning. So <coughs> the first thing that we really want to do when we've shot the road here, um, is to make sure that there are no notifiable diseases present. Uh, and this is actually the current up-to-date list of notifiable diseases for deer in the United Kingdom, uh, supplied to me by DEFRA just recently. Some of them will be very familiar to you, others will be less familiar to you. Some of them aren't even in the country yet, so chronic wasting disease uh, and epizootic uh, hemorrhagic disease don't even exist in the country but they're notifiable because the risk is very high that they may come into the country and it's our job to make sure that we know about them. So <clears throat> it is important for you to, to know about those and I'm going to touch on the more common ones as we go through the talk this morning. So when I shoot a roe deer or any deer for that matter, the first thing I'm going to do is walk up make sure it's dead and it's safe to handle it and then I'm going to have a look at its general body condition so I'm going to scan my eye over the whole carcass picking up any abnormalities that I see. And then once I've thoroughly checked it that way, I'm going to do what we call the gralic, or the green gralic, opening up the body cavity to have a look at the tissues inside and remove them, obviously. And uh, then we're going to have a look at the feet and the mouth and the skin surface as well. So a good general examination of the animal. <coughs> and as experienced deer managers, you'll be aware of uh, very quickly of any abnormalities in the condition of the deer. Uh, this is a picture actually of chronic wasting disease uh, in America, which thank God we don't have yet. Uh, and that's the kind of change in the animal's general condition that you might expect to see. But this particular uh, Zika deer here has actually got Yoni's disease and looks very, very similar. So you have no problem in picking that up if you would actually shot that particular deer. So the sort of things that are going to give you a poor body condition are going to be things like TB, which is obviously notifiable, uh, and chronic wasting disease, which I've already mentioned, uh, Yoni's disease as well. Parasites, heavy parasitic burdens might result in the animal having a very poor body condition, but usually you'll find other evidence of that when you're examining the animal. And any chronic disease uh, of the internal body organs, again, will probably cause the animal to lose condition. But as part of your gralic and examination and lardering of the animal, you will probably pick up other indicators as you go along. But the important point at this stage is that you've already highlighted the fact that there's probably something wrong with this beast. And this happened to me very recently. I shot a robot. Uh, first of all, its behavior wasn't ideal. And secondly, when I got up to it, it was quite clear its body condition was poor. And I'm immediately alerted to the fact that there's something wrong here. And I need to take personal protection for myself to make sure I don't get infected, and secondly, make sure it's not got a notifiable disease, and thirdly, then assess whether it's fit for the human uh, food market. <coughs> One of the things that we can look at uh, is to see if there is any anything exuding from the body orifices. The, the big one, and it's not really going to happen, I don't think, if you shoot a deer, but if you came across a dead deer, if you come across a dead deer and it's got bleeding, from its anus or its mouth or its nose, then be very, very careful about that because it may be anthrax, which is A, a notifiable disease, and more importantly, uh, is a disease that you can get for yourselves and it can be fatal. 
So if you came across a dead deer, possibly in good body condition, because it's a, a disease that is very, very acute and kills them very quickly, if you find any bleeding from the various body orifices, then be very, very careful about handling that animal. The most likely other thing that you're going to get is they have diarrhea, and again, this is a, 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 a deer that's got Yoni's disease, uh, and the diarrhea that will flow out of it once it's dead can be pure water uh, and very, very foul smelling. So again, that should raise your suspicion. Have a look at the skin surface. Uh, if there's hair loss, as you can see in this road deer here, this is not necessarily abnormal. This is actually a road deer moving from its winter coat to its summer coat, and it looks really quite moth-eaten uh, and, and, and uh, not very pleasant. But actually, uh, this, this, there's no changes to the skin in this animal, uh, and it, you know at the time of year that this is most likely what's going on, so you can re reduce your, your worries about that. Ticks, uh, keds are quite common in deer, occasional lice as well. Usually the numbers are not particularly high, but if it's in poor body condition, and it's got a heavy burden of these uh, ectoparasites, that again may support that this animal is not well. There's something really wrong with it because its immune system is not working very well. And it only also have warbles, which is actually a notifiable disease. And you'll notice that from uh, little holes in the skin, lumps in the skin, multiple little lumps over it. Uh, and if you're actually to remove the skin, you'll actually find these little uh, parasites underneath the skin as well. You come across funny stuff. Um, this is a, a deer's head with a lot of uh, hair loss uh, and there's no bleeding or anything here but this is a healed lesion of some kind. So this is not a big issue, particularly if it's just an isolated little area and everything else about the deer is normal, I wouldn't be worried about that at all. This is a little bit more concerning because it's obviously a kind of bleeding growth on the side of the deer here which uh, could raise some concern. Now again it could be an isolated thing. It may have no big worries for the food chain at all, but having spotted that, I would be very concerned to have a look around the rest of the skin surface and make sure there's no other changes, and also make sure there are no internal changes as well. So it may be quite local and can be dissected out, or it could be an indicator of more systemic disease. <coughs> Looking at the mouse is very important. These are actually photographs of foot and mouth disease, which you may or may not have seen. So it was talked about when you do your, your DSC level 1, you have to look out for it. Uh, but these are actual pictures. Uh, this is a sheep where you can see the tongue, all the, the epithelium of the tongue is split off and you've got this big ulcerated area. You can see this ulcerated area here. Notice how the skin is still on there or the, the, the surface is still there. Sometimes it's only when you touch it that it actually breaks off like a blister and all of a sudden it reveals a very large ulcer underneath. And this is the hard palate on the roof of the mouth in a, in a beast, cattle beast. And you can see how that's become all ulcerated as well. If you see something like that, you know you've got a really big problem. I hope you never do see it. The lesions can also occur in the feet. And this is the sort of thing you can see. This is between the two cleats in a, in a cattle beast, but it would be exactly the same in a deer. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the middle here. It can be round the side. And it's always round the side next to the skin edge to the horn side. Yep, so that's where you're looking for the lesions. So any ulcerated areas there are an indication that you might be dealing with mouth disease. But we see lots of limb abnormalities, and we're talking about urban deer today as well. <clears throat> so in my experience, I think with roe deer in particular, uh, broken legs as a result of, of traffic accidents is very, very common. Uh, and what I find remarkable compared with other species that I deal with as a vet is that roe deer in particular seem to be incredibly tolerant of a broken limb and will very often manage to survive with that and it eventually fixes itself, perhaps not in the right shape as you can see here, but it can often carry on and live a reasonably normal life. What I have also seen is when you get a broken leg like this, the deer will retract its leg like that uh, and hold it up and actually once you've shot it and it's down, you realise that that leg's absolutely solid and what's actually happened is it's protected itself by pulling its muscles in like that over a period of time and eventually they've all contracted and it's actually become absolutely solid and the animal will never ever be able to use its front leg again. You will see other queer things like this is another road deer shot not far away from here which uh, was born with a deformed front leg uh, and the net result is it was walking from three legs from the day it was born 
and it resulted in overgrowth of the horn on the hoof of the other front foot because of the abnormal posture that it had. And that brings me on nicely to looking at things called the Loudon Slippers, which you may have come across particularly in road deer. And we've done a little bit of work on these and I don't want to dwell on it too much today. But the bottom line is that it can be due to trauma as I showed you in the previous picture. It can be traditionally associated with road deer living on wet ground and the hooves not being worn down properly. There is now science to confirm that some cases are due to mineral deficiency and some work that we did and published in the deer magazine suggested that laminitis in roe deer might be quite important. And here's the two toes, if you like, of a roe deer, this is the normal ones, right down where the hoof would be in a normal roe deer. And these are the same bones from roe deer which have got these overgrown <coughs> hooves uh, and what we call a laden slipper. So you can see there's a dramatic change in the structure of the bone. See a bit of septic joints as well. I don't know why, but I see septic joints much more in Sika deer than I do in any other species of deer. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what the reason for that is. Uh, you'll get big swollen joints such as you see here and here. Uh, the, this one's ulcerated and actually bleeding or exuding the fluid from the joint. This one's completely closed. It may be multiple joints that are involved. Uh, and I think in these circumstances you want to be very, very careful about handling this because um, these joints we found contain either a, a bacteria called uh, Pasteurella or Yersinia uh, and both of these can actually cause disease in your cells, so you need to be very, very careful. These animals may also have poor body condition, which we talked about right at the beginning. And have a good look at the lymph nodes, the kidneys and the liver, because very often if it's got septic, then you'll find the lymph nodes become enlarged and you'll maybe find the liver and the kidneys are involved because they have a very large blood supply uh, and any bacteria that get into the circulation will hit them. And these are actually the kidneys from a cicadea which had uh, this uh, swollen foot here, the septic foot, and it had lesions throughout the kidneys as well. <coughs> Talking about lymph nodes, um, they are things that we check, obviously, or should check when we're looking at our roe deer. Uh, and the thing about lymph nodes is that they're everywhere in the body. They're all over the skin, just under the skin surface. Uh, they're, in, they're associated with every single organ in the body. So there's a lymph node for the stomach, there's a lymph node for the liver, a lymph node around the kidneys, and so on. Uh, and the thing about them is, and I think the rule of thumb from your point of view is, if you can't find them, then it's probably normal. All right, that, that's the easy bit. All right, that's a sort of nice, easy science bit because normally these lymph nodes may be very small and reactive. But if there's any disease in the animal, then they often start to get big. So if you suddenly bump into a big lymph node, then think about where that is in the animal and what part of the animal may be affected. So for example, uh, the popliteal lymph node, as we call it, lies in this area here in the hind leg. Uh, and those animals are shown today. That's the popliteal lymph node from this particular animal here. Um, and that meant there was septic lesions in its joints down here. So the lymph node that gets affected first is the one up there. Yep. And so it goes on. And the same applies here. If you've got mouth lesions or lesions in the throat, then the, the, the lymph nodes in the angle of the jaw all get swollen and enlarged. And we'll be talking about the lymph nodes associated with the internal organs as well. So just Keep your eyes open. If you find one, think about where it is in the animal. These are the most prominent ones. And then think about the areas that they serve. So these ones here serve the head and the neck. This one here serve the front leg. And these ones here serve the back leg here. So these are ones that you can have a look out for. So we've kind of talked about the animal before. We've opened it up so far. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about opening it up. So we've checked the animal over, we're quite satisfied that it's okay. We want to do the granite now, and we should do that within 30 minutes of shooting it, uh, if it's going to go into the food chain, to make sure that there's no risk of any bacteria in the gut getting into the uh, animal's carcass. And first impressions, I think, are really very important. So if you split the carcass, and the first thing you get a funny smell that you're not used to smelling, something unusual, that should raise your suspicions and concerns that something's maybe not right. 
assuming that it's been shot in the chest and, and it's been appropriately shot, then there shouldn't be any fluid in the abdomen, there should certainly be no blood in the abdomen, but any other fluid like pus or even a watery fluid, if it pours out the abdomen, again that should raise the suspicion that something's wrong. And then we'll remove the organs from the abdomen and we'll want to have a good look at them um, as we, we go through. So one of the things that we look for in the, in the digestive tract is the lymph node chain that lies along the gut. And, and here you can see the lymph node chain looks quite normal here. But then there's a very, very large lymph node here which suggests that there's something going on. And here again, we've got a chain of very large lymph nodes here which suggests again that there's some very reactive inflammatory or infectious condition going on uh, with the gut and that should raise your uh, suspicions that this may not be fit for the human consumption. Now the light's not very good in here and I'm sorry about that but I'm sure many of you that shoot roe deer when you've hung them up and this is hind legs would be up here hanging on the gambrel uh, and this is actually the fillets that you're seeing here and that's just the beginning of the chest cavity there so I hope you've got your orientation. And you'll often find lots and lots of these little black things. Have you noticed them before? Whole chains of them. And in some animals, they're very obvious. In others, you hardly see them. And they're usually sitting in the fat down the edges of the fillet here. These are what we call hemolymph nodes. They're completely normal. They're not abnormal at all. And the interesting thing is that we don't really understand what they do. But we know that they're normal and that they're normally meant to be there. So if it's ever cast your mind, oh, these are really obvious today, I wonder if that's important. Well, as far as we know, they're not important. They're meant to be there, they're not an indicator of any disease, and you shouldn't worry about them. Okay? This is TB. Again, I'm sorry about the light, but it's not very good, but uh, these are the sort of lymph nodes in the, the chain of the gut associated with TB, and you'll notice that they're yellow, they're knobbly, they're enlarged. Uh, and if you were daft enough to do it and slice it with a knife, there would be kind of pus pouring out from the inside. So if you see anything like this, then again, you should be very, very suspicious of it, uh, not only from the point of view of the food chain, but also from your own health point of view. So you want to be very, very careful of handling an animal if you see something like this. Yoni's disease, you get changes to the gut itself, uh, as well as sometimes changes to the lymph nodes. And we've talked about the body condition and we've also talked about the diarrhea. So they're all clicking together, giving you a picture, a pattern. These are some odd lesions. This is a, a brown lesion sitting on the rumen here, on the big stomach. Uh, and this is another one further down in the abdomen sitting in here. And these pictures were sent to me. Uh, and you'll come across these from time to time. And there may be one, there may be several of them, uh, and they appear to be, from our looking at them uh, under the microscope in the pathology lab, they appear to be walled off parasites. So it could be something like uh, liver fluke or other worms or parasites that quite often migrate as part of their lifestyle through the animal to get to the organ where they live, but they get lost basically, like I would this morning if I hadn't had my sat-nav, because I'd never have found this place. They get lost somewhere, and then they just get walled off. So if you see something like that, or like that, you'll notice there's no reaction round about it. It's just a little walled off area. Then I would just bin it. It's probably nothing to worry about. This is an interesting one. This is the gralic sitting here. There's the stomachs there, the intestines here, and there's a large water-filled cyst. Uh, sitting here, I think you can see that okay. Be very careful of that. It could be associated with tapeworms. Uh, and these water filled cysts that I've got um, that you can see here, if you burst them and let the fluid flow out, they're full of new little uh, tapeworms. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is get them on your hands or on the carcass, okay? Because that would seriously contaminate it. So if you come across something like this, then it's probably okay, the carcass, so long as there's not multiple ones throughout the carcass, it's just one, a single one off like that, and you certainly don't want to break them open and contaminate the carcass either. Liver fluke, a nice picture I took of a, a, a liver here with the fluke sitting on the surface, it's not obvious as obvious as that. Quite often the only time I ever see them is when I split into the liver and then they just pour out of the bile ducts that are inside the liver. Uh, and the liver can look remarkably normal as this one does here, but you can get quite profound changes to the liver, as you can see here. So all these white areas here are associated with changes to the liver, uh, uh, associated with parasitism. 
And clearly that liver would not be one that I'd want to have on my breakfast table. Okay, so we want to leave that. But it shouldn't affect the rest of the carcass. The rest of the carcass should be fine. Here's some other things, really odd bits and pieces that you may come across. These are almost certainly due to tumours. Uh, they, they, look hard, they, they look lumpy, they're hard when you touch them, and they're multiple all over that particular spleen there, uh, and again over here. And this is a liver which has got a huge growth on the end here. So again, this is probably tumour that's involved here. But tumours in deer, in my experience, are very rare, unless you know better. All right? So I'd love to hear from anyone that's, that's seen anything. But generally speaking, I think uh, tumours are very rare. If you do see them, I think they're much more likely to be in the liver. That, if you look at some of the, re the, the reports that have been written up, the liver seems to be the target organ in uh, the most common cases of tumour disease in deer. Just a little thing I want to pop in here just to, to get your input. Uh, I keep hearing from people in the field that if you get funny antlers and poorly developed antlers, such as this little rodeo's antlers here, that it's always an indication that they've got parasitism. Yep. Now, it's one of these anecdotal stories that's gone around for many, many years. But when I actually say to people, well, did you find any parasites in the animal? I never looked. Okay. So what I would like to suggest to you is, if you come across something like this that's got funny deformed antlers, uh, have, a, have a good look, make sure that there's no obvious parasitism about it. And if there is, I would certainly like to know about it. So uh, keep in touch. Now, cystic kidneys is one that I thought really needed to be brought in here. Now, you've done your green gallop, you've taken the beast home, you've hung it up, and you're now going to finish the larvae process. And this is when you normally take the kidneys out, along with the diaphragm, liver, and so on. And it may be the first time that you actually notice that there's a problem. Uh, and you'll notice that this kidney here is all lumpy and bumpy, but it's fluid filled, all right? They're fluid filled cysts, they're not hard like you get the tumours. And here's another one, you can see cysts here, here, and here. So these are what we call bilateral, so both kidneys are involved in both these cases here. Uh, and this is what I mean about when you split the carcass. So if you split a carcass like that, you sometimes get a urine smell coming out the carcass as you split it, and that should be a telltale to you to have a good look at the kidneys because very often if both kidneys are involved as you see in these two pictures here then the animal may be effectively in kidney failure all right to a greater or lesser extent and the carcass really is not fit uh, to be put into the food chain this is an interesting one one of my own rodeo in fact because this is one of its kidneys which are split in half and it's absolutely normal but the other kidney here which doesn't really look like a kidney because it was just a big fluid ball, all right? And when you broke into it, just urine poured out of it, and, and basically that kidney no longer existed. Now that carcass didn't have a urine smell about it, uh, and the thing about kidneys is that we're over-endowed with enough kidney function to keep us going, and that's why we can donate kidneys to somebody that, that sadly got a kidney failure. So this deer here was absolutely normal because this kidney was working perfectly, and in spite of the fact that that one had completely failed, there was no urine smell about the carcass. The carcass was quite fit to eat. Yep. Whereas these ones here might, in fact, be unfit to eat because of the extent of their kidney disease. A couple of funny ones for you. Um, mummified fetuses. They're not common, but you may split the carcass open uh, and find that the, the uterus is there, but it doesn't have fluid-filled <coughs> fetuses in it. It's actually hard and solid, and when you break into it, you quite often find a wee bag of bones, as you can see here, and in this picture here. And this is where the, the fetus has died inside the carcass, and then it's all the sort of soft tissues, if you like, have been resorbed, and you're just left with a little pile of bones inside. Uh, again, as long as there's no infection associated with that, as long as all the lymph nodes are normal, then that carcass is probably fit to go into the food chain. So that's us done the abdomen, and we're coming to finish off with the thorax now. Uh, and again, I usually just, I don't tend to do this in the field. I know some people do, but I tend to take my carcass home uh, and split the thorax uh, at home. I hang it up, split the cork of the carcass, and have a look inside. And again, as you split through the sternum, uh, have a, 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 a bit of a sniff to make sure that it smells nice and wholesome. Uh, make sure there's no fluid pouring out, uh, other than blood, obviously. Um, and that the lungs are not stuck to the chest wall and there's no lumps and bumps all over the place 
and have a look at the lymph nodes as well. So let's have a wee look at some of these. So this is a close-up picture. This is one lung field here, and this is another lung field here. And this is the middle section, which we call the mediastinum between the two lungs. And these are the bronchial lymph nodes, and they are quite normal in this animal. Uh, you, can, you can see them, but they're not grossly enlarged. I'll show you some abnormals in a minute. And therefore, this is quite acceptable. And you would look at the lungs as well. They should be normally quite nice and pink and nice and spongy throughout their substance. Here's what we call adhesions. Uh, so there's a rib, there's a rib, there's a rib, there's a rib, there's a rib. But you'll notice that these are what we... It's sticky, like fibrous tissue. And, and quite often, the lung will be stuck. So these are fibrous tissue adhesions between the chest wall and the lung. Uh, and in this particular case... This was the only adhesion in the whole of the chest cavity. That's the bullet hole there where it was shot. And this is just a small adhesion here. And the lung itself looked quite normal when you actually felt it and touched it and examined it. The reason for these occurring is sometimes very difficult to know. Um, it could be that it's been fighting in a rut situation and just had a really bad bang in the chest. If it's more extensive, it's maybe hit by a car or something like that. And what actually happens is this, the lining of the chest cavity is very rich in blood vessels uh, and it gets very reactive and starts to get very inflamed quite easily. Uh, and we just get a bit of a pleurisy and a bit of adhesions forming and the carcass is absolutely fit for human consumption. On the other hand, sometimes the adhesion, and again, I'm sorry about the light, but this is all adhesions. This is lung tissue here and this is all adhesions here and here as well. And this is a close-up view here. The whole of the lung field in this, this is a red deer if I remember correctly, uh, are completely and utterly stuck to the, the chest wall. Uh, and the lung itself doesn't look entirely normal. So I would be very, very suspicious about that uh, and wonder in fact if that was not more infection than some kind of trauma incident. And I would be very, very nervous about putting that into the food chain. Uh, and I would probably dispose of it. Uh, or you could leave it to a veterinary meat inspector to, to make a decision. Uh, and obviously when you s sign your declaration, you could indicate that this is what you'd found and someone needs to check this out before it goes into food chain. I get quite often asked questions about lungs and sometimes they don't look entirely pink. Uh, and uh, they can sometimes look a little bit like this. So this looks as if it might be quite abnormal. And, and one of the things to remember is that lung is very light it's full of air and it should feel very spongy. So this could actually be hemorrhage and shock associated with having been shot and be completely up and up, completely normal. The other thing you sometimes get is if you've shot a beast, you've granulated it, you've laid it on its side, it's laying there for an hour or two before you get back to the larder to, to do the rest of the butchering. What happens is that the blood may filter down through the lungs to the lower lung and collect there. Uh, and it sometimes <coughs> give you this pooling effect that makes it look as if it's abnormal. But in this case, there's two or three things you can do. You can have a wee feel of it all and make sure there's no lumps, bumps inside it. It's not hard and, and, and it's still got a spongy feel. The other thing you can do is just take a wee bit off and put it in a wee bowl of water. And lung should always float. If it sinks to the bottom of the bowl, then there's something seriously wrong. Yep. So these are little practical things that you can do for yourselves. But this is just due to hemorrhage. Uh, and it's nothing to do with the animal having a disease. And there's no other evidence of disease in the carcass that we've found so far. This is TB. Uh, again, I'm sorry about the light, but there is some big changes to the lymph nodes in this uh, lung here. And this whole lung lobe here, and some of these lung lobes there, look completely abnormal. They're solid. They've changed colour. They're white. But they're not spongy anymore. They're hard. Yep. And the local lymph nodes that lie along the centre here are also enlarged as well. All right, so that would be a very suspicious finding. Lung worms and deer, two different types. The one we most often see is the large lung worms that actually lie inside the airways. And that sort of funny granular appearance is actually solid lung worm. There are hundreds of them sitting in that airway. So if you take your red pluck out, and you just take your knife and just zip down the trachea, you know what I mean, down the windpipe, and just let it fall apart. It should be nice and clear be nice and dry, there should be no worms inside it at all. And if it's full of worms like then this, then clearly this animal has a fair degree of parasitism. These lungs here, uh, this is a further view, and this is a more close-up view, are from roe deer, 
which have a different type of lung worm. And you will not find the worms in the airways in these. So you won't see anything like this. The worms are actually in the lung tissue themselves. And this is the worm sitting here in amongst the lung tissue. Uh, and this is what we call small lung worms. And we see them, or I've seen them in rhodia, uh, particularly in areas where there's a lot of sheep because mostly it's sheep that get this particular form of lung worm, but it can affect road deer as well. And these lungs are paler than normal, and they're harder than normal, more knobbly than normal, and it's usually diffusely through all the lungs. So you'll probably be able to recognize that quite, quite easily. <coughs> so that's been, I've only had 35 minutes, so uh, as a quick run through things, I could have gone on for ages, but you're all needing your coffee anyway. So just to summarize, most of the deer that you cull will be normal. So what I've said to you is giving you the really bad end of the spectrum. Yeah? Nine times out of ten, what you're going to cull is going to be absolutely normal. You're going to do your growl up your lard ring, and you're going to find nothing that concerns you whatsoever. The important thing is, though, to be aware of the possibilities, and particularly the things that are high risk. And hopefully this lecture has highlighted some of these things for you so that you can get an idea of what you might be able, you might be able to diagnose for yourselves. But follow your instincts. You, you probably shot a lot of deer. You probably know what it looks like to be normal. And therefore, if you come across something that's abnormal, even if you don't precisely know what's wrong with it, you'll probably, your gut instinct, is this really fit for food, 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 food chain or not? It's probably a good, uh, a good judgment call. If you're not sure about the carcass, then you're probably better to bin it, yeah, rather than to use it. Much safer to let that one go than put it into the food. And most importantly, and perhaps should have been the first bullet point in this slide, be careful of your own health. All right? um, as vets, we tend to be very blasé about these some things sometimes because we handle you know, disease cases all the time. But I've actually got more and more cautious, maybe to do with old age, I don't know. But I tend to wear disposable gloves now uh, almost all the time, whereas in the past I was very bad at not doing that. Because there are some nasty bugs out there, and the last thing you want to do is collect them for yourselves. And I'll just finish with one more slide as a little plea, if I'm allowed to do that, Mr. Organiser. Yes. Um, as I said to you, we've, we've started the Scottish Deer Project, and uh, one of the things that we're particularly interested in at the moment in researching in um, is antler female deer, particularly roe deer uh, and perukes. Okay? Uh, and we're really, really anxious to um, get pictures, as you can see here, of any that you come across, ideally to collect a blood sample in a tube uh, and to have a look at the reproductive organs. And clearly if it's a female antler uh, roe deer, and it's almost always roe deer that are involved, uh, take a picture of the uterus and the ovaries in situ as you growlith the animal, maybe with your mobile phone, and then collect the uterus and ovaries as well uh, and give me a call. Uh, and if it's a male animal, and it's a peruke, something like this, then what we're actually interested in is collecting the testes from these animals, testicles from these animals, and having a look at them. Uh, because we want to try and get more information as to what's causing these to happen. Uh, it's almost always going to be roe deer. We've got our theories as to what we think is wrong, but I'm not going to, to twist your judgment at this point. All I want to do is collect material. Uh, and the more we get, the more information we can get, the more science we can do, uh, and hopefully, get some answers as to why these things occur. So with that, I'll say thank you. I hope I haven't bored you to tears. Uh, I'll be very happy during coffee to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you very much.